Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an indefinable line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Makeshift Stories presents a monthly journey into the improbable. Today's story, 189, Otherworld. Read by Mitchell Two. Audio post-production by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, you might discover an ancient secret world humans are not supposed to know about. The heat washed over Morgan like a door on a blast furnace had suddenly opened. Sweat immediately began trickling down her back, under the down jacket she had just zipped up to ward off a bitter January wind. It felt like that small act of Arctic survival had just been a second ago, but a lifetime away. She squinted, behind the murk of heavily fogged glasses. Morgan didn't remember walking out of the chilly winter evening into an overheated building. She didn't even understand how it could have happened. She had just been in the center of a park. It didn't make sense, but the existence of that growing trickle of sweat and the smothering heat could not be denied. Hadn't it just been cloudy, gray, and getting onto evening? Instinctively, she glanced down, under the clouded lenses, expecting to see her snow boots on a tile floor surrounded by a melting pile of winter brown road sludge. Instead, she found reddish yellow sand, darkened by rapidly evaporating meltwater from the last dirty snow on her boots, yielding under the intense heat. On the edge of her vision, Echo's anxious tail switched back and forth, whisking the fine silica grains into patterns reminiscent of a boat's wake. Where are we, boy? Morgan asked rhetorically. But the cat stopped in mid-sweep and looked up at her as if it had a reply. Echo suddenly arched his back and hissed at something behind Morgan. She spun around, stumbling as dizziness momentarily overwhelmed her, then ripped her useless glasses off and squinted in an attempt to bring the weird scene in front of her into focus. She and Echo were standing at the foot of an ancient ramp, leading up to the second floor of a long, two-story stone structure. Each level consisted of a colonnade made up of plain, squarish yellow rock posts holding up an equally plain lintel. The rectangular spaces the arrangement formed looked initially modern, and Morgan thought they might be in some type of immense foyer, which made no sense. How had they gotten there? Morgan wiped the heavy condensation off her glasses on the sleeve of her coat and put them back on. Now she could see the eight Egyptian statues adorning the columns on the second level, surrounded by camera-touting tourists in shorts and sun hats to protect them from the midday sun. The trickle of sweat on Morgan's back was joined by a dribble on her forehead. It started under her wool toque and made its way along the promise of future wrinkles, past the tension furrow between her eyebrows and into her eyes. She tried to wipe the sweat away with the back of her gloved hand, then stood confused and disoriented. The Egyptian temple and tourists persisted. Where are we, Echo? She repeated. Luxor, the cat replied without hesitation. Not the Las Vegas Hotel, I'm guessing? That would be too weird, Echo noted calmly. No, we're in Luxor, Egypt, near the Valley of the Kings, at the base of the ramp to Queen Hatshepsut's temple. And you're telling me we've somehow gone from the park to Egypt in one step isn't weird to you? Echo simply glared at her. Had her cat just shrugged? At this point, Morgan no longer trusted her senses. The cat's tail began to swish again. A nearby security guard, having finished scrutinizing a busload of seniors, noticed them and was coming their way, waving his arms and shouting. I don't think they like cats here. Echo suggested, then tried to push his way between Morgan's feet. When did you start talking? Morgan asked, assuming this was just another part of the weirdness, then bent down to scoop up her loyal pet. Choosing to say nothing, Echo purred. So you don't remember how you got there. It's an absolute blank between going out to look for your cat 
and finding yourself in Egypt twelve weeks later. Dr. Hans Milstrom leaned back in his chair, unconsciously fingering his pen. He became conscious of his fiddling, then tried to discreetly put the ballpoint down. And you take a cat everywhere with you now. My vet said it was okay. She thinks whatever happened to us caused Echo to get separation anxiety. Morgan sat with the small gray Abyssinian nestled on her lap. It had fallen asleep as soon as she had taken Echo out of his carrier and began to absent-mindedly pet him. Before the incident, uh, I mean... Look, I don't know what I mean. I'm really average, Dr. Milstrom. There's no family history of mental illness or amnesia or Alzheimer's, nothing. I've never just walked away in the night or have experienced memory loss before. It's all in my file. I work as a data analyst. I'm very rational. I don't do impulsive things. Ask any of my friends. That's all right. I believe you, Miss Kelly. And you're here because you think I might be able to help you? Yes, I've tried everything else. I wasn't injured. I've had x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, neuroimaging, and nothing shows up. You know, the Egyptian authorities didn't know what to make of me. I didn't have a passport, and they had no record of entry. Some thought I was the victim of a slave trade scheme. A few suspected I was a spy using the unusual situation as a cover, but most thought I had just fallen off or was intentionally pushed from a river cruise ship, hit my head, and lost my memory. Well, Morgan, do you mind if I call you Morgan? The latter explanation does seem the most probable, Hans noted, watching her reaction carefully. I don't remember going on a holiday. I would have told someone. I wouldn't have just left in the middle of a work week. I can show you my credit card records. I didn't buy a plane ticket or a cruise. There was nothing going on at work or in your personal life. No job loss, no breakup. Sometimes an extreme emotional event can trigger memory blocks. Everyone has asked me that, Morgan retorted. I was hoping you would go beyond the obvious, Dr. Milstrom. That's why I'm here. All I remember is Echo had somehow gotten out again. It was cold and getting dark. I was worried, so I went looking for him. There's a park near my house. That's where he usually heads. I was halfway across the big open field when I heard him meowing. I followed the sound and found Echo just staring into empty space, hissing. He suddenly sprang at something, the way cats do when they are hunting. I ran to catch up. Then I found myself standing in front of Queen Hepshepsut's temple. Hmm. So, you're hoping hypnotic regression therapy might help you. Exactly. Okay, well, I want you to know there are no guarantees. Regression therapy doesn't work for everyone. I understand, Doctor. You can call me Hans. I can fit you in next week. After agreeing on a time, Morgan put Echo back in his carrier and left. The building wasn't the most prosperous. The carpets in the halls were worn. The air was a bit musty and tainted with decades of occupation, and Morgan felt if she touched the dated fake wood wainscoting, it would be greasy with generations of hand sweat. She used her elbow to press the elevator call button and waited. What do you think? Echo purred from his cat carrier. I'm willing to give it a try. He's the best regression therapist in the area. Are you going to tell him about me? The elevator dinged, and the door jerked open, doing nothing to instill confidence in its new riders. I'm not sure yet. Echo clawed at the wire mesh of his carrier. Don't, he hissed. Now, Morgan, I want you to breathe deeply. Use your diaphragm. Bring the air in through your nose and slowly out through your mouth. Try to feel the air fill your lungs. Concentrate on the movement of the air, nothing else. There is just air and you. I think you'll find this easier without your cat distracting you. I'm going to ask you to put Echo back in his carry case. He'll only be in arm's reach away, Hans assured, 
as Morgan reluctantly lifted the cat off her chest and back into the cloth and plastic cat carrier. Echo protested, stretching his forelegs and extending his claws, making it difficult to force him through the opening. I'll be okay, Morgan soothed. I'll turn the crate so you can watch. Now there, that's a good boy. The cat calmed down while Hans made notes on his tablet. In the context of the dated office, the therapist's use of the device was almost jarring to Morgan. She had wondered why a top therapist operated out of such a dated, unstylish, and partially run-down building. His client list was liberally salted with well-known celebs, so the office had been a surprise, but his recommendations were stellar. She decided the choice of office must have been something to do with creating a sense of permanence. Everything was changing so fast these days. I don't trust him, Echo whispered so Dr. Milstrom wouldn't hear, then quickly added, Call it instinct. Shh, Echo. Did you say something, Morgan? Morgan shook her head and lay back, feeling a bit self-conscious about the cliché she was participating in. But what other choice did she have? The mainstream medical profession had all but written her off, saying there was nothing wrong with her, and going as far as implying she was faking her memory loss to attract a movie or book deal for her story. That's it. Relax. Close your eyes and concentrate on your breathing. In through the nose and out through the mouth. In through the nose and out through the mouth. Perfect. Just keep going. There's nothing other than your breath. You and the air in and around you. Concentrate on your body. How does it feel at the moment? In through your nose and out through your mouth. Great. Now, I want you to think about the night Echo went missing. Can you describe what was around you when you found him? Morgan took a deep breath, held it, then let it out with a sigh. It was gray everywhere, she started. The sun was going down behind the clouds, so it was getting dark earlier than usual. Everything was blurring into a wintry gray twilight. Even the snow was no longer white. The wind was picking up and blowing it around like static on an old analog TV. Were there any sounds? What were you feeling? Hans encouraged gently. There was traffic in the distance, deadened by the snow. I felt isolated. I felt like everything was so far away. It was as if I was in a different world, looking back at where I had come from. There was something foreboding about the situation, but I was relieved to have found Echo. His breed comes from a warm climate. They don't have thick fur. Did you know Abyssinians have been around since the time of the pharaohs? I was worried. If I couldn't find him, he'd freeze. I was apprehensive because something in the field had made Echo react. Egypt. So, you're thinking about Egypt when you found him. Hans noted something on his tablet. No, I was just concerned Echo wouldn't make it through the night. It was going to get extremely cold. Okay, okay, Morgan. You found Echo. Now try to relive the moment you discovered him. I feel happy. At least at first, but there's something wrong. Echo doesn't respond to me. His eyes are focused on the darkness. I can't see anything there. Maybe it's a dog that's been let off leash. Echo had bad run-ins with dogs. I'm trying to approach him, but he's backing away. Why is he doing that? What's he seeing that I can't? I'm shivering now. It's not from the cold. Echo's tail has started swishing. He's crouching, looking like an over-tightened spring. He jumps into the dark. There's nothing there. I I'm staring into a, a void. An EMS vehicle screamed by on the street outside, breaking Morgan's concentration. She opened her eyes. I've already told you this. Hans stood up and pulled a heavy cloth curtain over the window, then apologized. Sorry about that. You're doing great. You're starting to re-experience rather than explain. Please. Close your eyes and imagine the moment again. 
the moment your cat vanished before your eyes. He didn't vanish. He jumped, Morgan corrected. Just relax, Morgan, and put yourself back in that moment before you and Echo found yourselves in Egypt. Take a few deep breaths. Focus on your breathing. Good. Now, concentrate on the exact moment Echo jumped. You are about to follow him. What do you see? What did you feel? Nothing, Morgan started to squirm. I know this is uncomfortable for you, but you need to get past this. There is something more there. You've hinted at it. You're apprehensive. Echo is reacting. What is causing that, Morgan? There was nothing, Morgan insisted, balling her hands into fists. Please, try and relax again. Focus on your breathing. There's nothing else, just the breath, the feeling of the couch against your back, clothes against your skin. That's great. Tell the voice in your head claiming there's nothing more you can remember to be quiet. And when it stops, drop back into that moment. Echo is in mid-flight to where? Where is Echo going? Echo, in his pet carrier, became agitated and started clawing at the black nylon mesh. He's gone. I mean, there's nothing, nothing at all in front of me. Morgan started kneading the top of her thighs in time with Echo's clawing. I'm frightened, surprised, concerned, and frantic. I don't understand what I'm seeing. Is it a shadow from one of the spruce trees along the street at the edge of the park? No, that can't be. They're too far away. It's an empty void, a hole in the world, and I can hear his meows coming from it. Echo sounds in distress. What's wrong with him? Is he hurt? I don't want to go into that darkness, but Echo has been a friend for ten years. He started yowling in that guttural screech cats use before a fight. I I've got to help. I'm in the darkness now. Echo's growling. I can hear his claws scratching at the stone. There's something else here with us. I can feel it. No, there's two of them. It's so hot and bright. My glasses are fogged. Someone is yelling. Morgan sighed. We're in Egypt. Great stop, Morgan. You're making awesome headway, Hans encouraged. I want you to focus on the other presence you felt just before you jumped to where you were found. What are you feeling? Why do you know there's someone else? I... I was... I... I didn't... I, I mean... He, Echo, only growls when he's threatened by something. He once yowled at an empty wall in my closet. After, I found out someone had died in there. You know, cats can sense things we can't. Don't explain, Morgan. Relive. You are in the void. You hear your cat. Go back to the moment. What is there? There's a presence. I think more than one. I'm straining to see, but it's, it's so dark. The place smells musty. It's dank, like a cave or basement that hasn't been aired out in years. Concentrate on the smell. Now, what are you seeing? Hans suggested gently. I can't see anything. No, that's not right. Maybe there are shadows. I can see Echo's eyes glowing. That's common for dogs and cats. It's a special reflective layer at the back of their eyes which helps them see in low light, Hans explained. But it means there was a light source, however dim. Look around. Find the light, Morgan. Tell him nothing. Nothing at all. Morgan thought she heard Echo meow. She tried to quiet the cat. He's trying to help us. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you were saying, Morgan. Focus on that moment, not your cat. You are in a place. It has a musty smell. You can see Echo's eyes. What is around you? Morgan hesitated. There's a gate. It has a carved ram's head on the top of one post, and... I'm not sure what to call it, but it looks like a lanky dog's head on the other. I think that was what Echo was yowling at. Maybe it's a coyote or a jackal. I'm hearing something else now. 
there's a snake and two figures, like living Egyptian hieroglyphs. They're asking Echo a question. Echo meowed and scratched at the cat carrier, breaking Morgan's concentration. Do you really want to do this? The cat protested. I'm sorry. It's gone now, Dr. Milstrom. I can't remember anything else. That's fine, that's fine. We made great headway today, Morgan. I'll schedule another session next week. I'd recommend not bringing your cat. He's distracting you. Hans finished his notes, then turned off his tablet. To be continued. ATB is making it possible for us to amplify the voices of Albertans and Alberta podcasters. This week, we're giving a shout out to Let's Get Lit. Let's Get Lit is a poetry podcast presented by the Writers Guild of Alberta. In each episode, host Ray Ann and Matthew interview poets based in Alberta and Western Canada about the power of poetry to support and promote arts and literacy. They also enjoy a glass of wine chosen to match the poet's personality and style while learning more about each poet and asking why poetry matters. You can listen to Let's Get Lit on Audio Boom or wherever you get your podcasts. Find out more at writersguild.ca. Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB Financial. To listen to other great APN award-winning podcasts, such as Not There Yet, a series of short essays by Terence C. Gannon covering a wide range of subjects from the perspective of the second decade of the 21st century. Head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com. Makeshift Stories is released twice a month around the 1st and the 15th. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Too. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by David Hume. To find out more about David, head over to davidhume.me. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or any of your favorite podcast services. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything. <laughs>